Hi, how are you? <laughs> thanks so much for coming, and thank you for um, your flexibility. We had to reschedule, so I'm extremely grateful that you're here. We have um, some very important material that we want to go over, and um, I also wanted to thank uh, Jeffrey Jones, who's here from Carlton Law, who um, is a friend to our group, and thank you for coming. Um, so on behalf of the Caregiver Support Group, I'm happy to introduce to you Ed Lafferty. Ed is a Southeastern Pennsylvania Public Affairs Specialist for the Social Security Administration, and we are so looking forward to this presentation. And without further ado, I'm going to turn the program over to Ed. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ed Lafferty. I'm a Public Affairs Specialist uh, for Social Security. Uh, we're just going to do an overview of Social Security. Now, I've titled it Solutions, Strategies, and Answers. And the reason for it, part of it is we actually do a newsletter in southeastern Pennsylvania called Solutions, Strategies, and Answers for uh, HR professionals, uh, benefits people, other advocates and organizations. But the other point was just uh, in terms of what Jan had wanted me to talk about. So we're going to do an overview of Social Security, the basic programs, and talk about some of the so-called strategies. And I only say so-called because they're all on our website. Telling you ahead of time, www.socialsecurity.gov, all of the information I'm talking about you can find on our website. What I'm going to do when we're finished here, tomorrow or Thursday, I'm sending links, basically about 20, 25 links, to all of the pertinent areas that I'm going to be talking about, in addition to which I'll send links to the publications. There are several in the back. I hope everyone has them. One, how to create an account online, how your retirement benefit is figured, when to start receiving benefits, how work affects your benefits, and our flagship, understanding the benefits. So you'll basically be getting links to all of those. So just letting you know you don't have to write down all of the URLs and get all the information. So, what we're going to talk about, a little bit about what you should know before you file for retirement, what you need to know afterwards, touch a little bit about how work affects benefits because that's kind of the linchpin sometimes for a decision to uh, file for retirement benefits with Social Security. We're going to talk about family benefits, spouses benefits, survivor benefits, and at the end, touch a little bit on Medicare if we have time. Now, we only have a limited amount, so we'll get to that or we won't. So just let you know, www.medicare.gov. Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services basically handle Medicare. It's a separate federal agency, and so we are the point of contact. You have to sign up with us to enroll, but things like durable medical goods, what a provider receives, what's in the formulary of a prescription drug program, that all goes through Medicare. So that's why I've left it at the end, but just want to highlight it because we do get people who ask questions about Medicare, and some of these are beyond our purview, so just letting you know. What I want to do first, though, is talk about the My Social Security account. I'll ask a question. There, there's no prize, by the way, for a right or wrong answer. How many people have signed up, actually s set up a, an account online? Bless you, all those who have. For those who haven't, please do so. The really important thing is, Social Security, as of 2011, stopped sending out the paper statements that said how much you would receive from Social Security. This is your earnings record. These are the amounts on which you pay Social Security taxes. They've actually created an online account. In this past September, they started sending those out again. They're done in five-year increments, age 25, 30, 35, 40. If you're 60 or older and no one needs to put their hand up to see if they qualify, you'll be getting it every year. But either way, if you don't have it, and also not just for you, but for your spouses, siblings, friends, enemies, anyone, everyone should be looking at this. Everything we're going to be talking about in the next few minutes is dependent on the year earnings, uh, your record, your earnings record, for each one of you being accurate. And all you have to do, due diligence, it takes a few minutes, you create an account, you bring it up, look at the years, make sure we've got the right numbers. You're the only one who's going to know. Are you the one who earned these amounts? And we want to make sure it's right, because everything else is dependent on that. Before we do anything else, do we have the right numbers? It takes 30 seconds due diligence every year. What's nice about doing it online is you can actually save it, you can print it out. But either way, whether you've just received the paper statement, electronic, you create your own account, please do look at it. Everyone should be checking, and that's not just someone close to retirement. 
If you have kids, grandkids are paying in Social Security, if 18 or older, they should be looking at this. Make sure we've got the right numbers. So the way you would find it, and yes, this is one of the uh, screenshots on www.socialsecurity.gov. It is true, we have YouTube videos of cats. I just want to point out to you that we have lots of YouTube videos, so Retirement 101, a range on disability, so everything's on there. They get like three, 4,000 hits. The cat gets 100,000 easily because apparently everyone is willing to watch a 60 second video of a cat filing for retirement. So, but if it gets you on, great. Anyway, my social security is on our front page. Online services, if you're already on social security, if you have someone, uh, because we're talking about caregivers, a parent or a loved one who's on Social Security, you can actually, if they can create an account, you can't do it for them, but if they create an account, they can change your address, change direct deposit, get a benefit verification, a proof of income letter, even a 1099, can all be printed out. It's very easy. And one I do want to highlight, retirement estimator. The statement that comes to you actually assumes you're going to continue working at the amount you're earning with cost of living changes over a period of time and that you go all the way up to retirement. What if you stop earlier? Or what if you change jobs? So you make more money, less money. Retirement Estimator actually lets you create what if scenarios. So very simple, it actually uses your earnings record. It's very, very user friendly. You really can follow the prompts easily. So the point is create an account, then later on look at the Retirement Estimator. If you're thinking of filing for benefits, say way down the line, not at all, or you're gonna file for retirement, but you're gonna stop work well ahead. What happens if I don't pay into Social Security? The retirement estimator will really give you the numbers on those, and those are accurate because it actually accesses your earnings record. So retirement estimator. But the real key is if you're talking about benefits, notice it'll bring you up to this page, and off on the right side, I'm sorry on that, it says retirement. It looks like it's retirement, and perhaps for some of you it is just retirement, but it's retirement. And if you click that, you get this page, four people on retirement, one of whom looks like Lurch from the Adams family. I don't know if they did that deliberately, but he does appear to be falling on the other three people. Over here is our retirement planner. What's nice about the planner, because we're talking about Social Security in a general way, but it's different for everyone in terms of your own needs, your own expectations, your own histories. So if you go to the retirement planner, and on the right-hand side you'll see retirement again, and if you click that, it goes through a list of things, how to apply, how spouse's benefits, how work affects your benefits, just about everything we're gonna be talking about, you can get on the retirement planner and far, far more. So my point is, go to the retirement planner, it really is useful, and rather than just tracking through four or five slides, just put in retirement planner in the search engine, bang, it comes up. Very useful because even though all of you have questions about retirement or survivors or disability perhaps, the planner touches on a wider range. So some of the things that you might not have considered that you should be asking, they're on there. So it's a really useful tool, good reference tool. This is so simple, I'm quickly gonna go through, but just to be aware, we are talking about covered earnings. That is, people have paid Social Security taxes on these earnings. You have to be insured to get retirement benefits. You also have to be insured to get disability and survivors, but in many cases, you don't need as much work. But for retirement, the basic point is you have to earn what are called 40 credits. It averages out to 10 years of work. And the reason we do it that way is I have nothing to do with it. But the way Social Security does it, you'll notice you earn $1,220 in 2015. You have a credit, four credits, little, almost $5,000, you have four credits. So, that's why we say 10 years. It doesn't necessarily have to be 10 years consecutively. Does it add up to 40 credits? It's an either or principle. You either have 40 credits or you don't. If you don't have 40 credits, no money is due. If you have more than 40 credits, it's just a threshold. So in many cases, when you look at your statement, it says you have 40 credits, and you'll say, I've worked many, many more years than 10. Obviously, they're just saying you're insured. So basic point. How retirement benefits are figured. I brought this, uh, the um, handout for the uh, 2015, someone who's turning 62 this year. But you can actually get the publication for differing years. So if you were 62 last year, the year before. But it gives you a nice overview. The really important point is Social Security uses the highest 35 years of your earnings. 
not the high three or five or ten. You, in effect, are vested, if you want to call it that, after ten years, you're insured, but the the average over most of your working lifetime is always you. So if you didn't pay into Social Security for five years, 10, 15, Social Security is still using 35 years. Some might include zeros. So just be aware of that when you look at it. The formula is applied and results in what's called a full retirement age amount. Now we call a full retirement age, or FRA, I'm going to refer, so I don't have to write that each time and say it. You'll also see it as retirement age. On our own website, there are a couple places on the actuarial page where it says normal retirement age. It's all the same. Full retirement age. Maximum taxable earnings, the highest amount that someone could be taxed for Social Security this year for cash benefits. If you want cash benefits, the maximum would be 118,500. Anyone beyond that is not paying Social Security taxes on that. It's basically 6.2% of your your income. But again, it's covered earnings, really highlighting that. When do you start receiving? You get your full benefit if you wait until your full retirement age. This is why I'm emphasizing it. So your FRA, your full retirement age, it's not, the amount is not reduced based on age. It's kind of a circular argument. Your full retirement age, you get your full benefit. If you go on prior to your full retirement age, and the 62 is the earliest you can apply for retirement benefits, you can go on at 62 and a half, 64, 65 and 11 months. But if you apply prior to full retirement age, you're going to take a reduced amount. How much of that is, a, is reduced depends on when do you go on, 62 or 63. The closer you are to your full retirement age, the higher your benefit, the greater the percentage, the closer it is to your full retirement amount. It is a permanent reduction. So come full retirement age, it doesn't suddenly ratchet upwards. So you have to make a decision ahead of time in the sense that, yes, you're going to take that amount, but it's a permanent cut. On the other hand, you're taking it early, so you're getting the money up front. If you delay past your full retirement age, there are what are called, and we're going to talk about those, delayed retirement credits. Your benefit is increased. So you have a range here. You go on as early as 62, you take the lowest amount of your full retirement amount, but if you delay till full retirement age or beyond, you'll get a higher amount. So it all depends on funding streams, your health, longevity. Do you want the money now? Can you invest it? Do you have to spend it? Any number of things. And you'll see all these financial planning websites talking about it. There are some cases where for some people, you should be applying early. I've said this before, and I am, a couple of you have been here before, but for me, all of the men in my family die very early. In my wife's family, everyone lives like way, way beyond the average age. She'll probably wait. If all of the men in my family die in their early 60s, when do you think I'm applying for benefits? <laughs> See? Good point. So, when we talk about full retirement age, and again, no one has to raise their hand unless you feel the urge. If you're born between 43 and 54, your full retirement age is 66. If you apply as early as 62, you only get 75% of that amount. You take a 25% cut. Now, 25% at 62, if you waited till 63 or 4, you would get a higher amount. So I've done the, uh, the, the most you could be losing is 25%. But it's a hefty cut. On the other hand, you're going on four years ahead of time. So you have to trade that off. Come the time you hit 66, that thing, with the exception of cost of living adjustments, or if you were working and you could add to one of those 35 years or replace them, but basically the percentages are going to stay the same. You'll have taken a permanent cut in your benefit. Now you'll notice people born 55, 56, 7, 8, 9, it goes up incrementally two months until anyone born 60 and later, it's age 67, and there's a 70% of the full retirement age, but they're going on five years ahead of time. Again, a trade-off. Go on early, get a lesser amount, but it is permanent. So that's where longevity, health, funding streams, obviously, do you need the money, and so forth, come into play. If you go on, and I've actually copied this off the website, so I apologize for it being scrunched up, but it, it necessitates paying attention for one second on this. For a delayed retirement credit, beginning with the month of your full retirement age, ending with the month before your 70, so this only really counts until 70. At 70, you want to be applying for benefits as far as Social Security is concerned. There's no advantage to waiting. But at, 
before then. You get a credit for any month, you're at least full retirement age, you're insured, remember you had to have worked enough, and you don't receive any retirement benefits. And it's an 8% increase, straight across the board. So that 8% comes at the end of the year, it's, on t it's part of your full retirement amount. It, they don't, it's, there's no compounding. For those of you clever enough to go, do I get 8% of the 8%? No, it's just a straight amount, it goes up 8%. It's actually two-thirds of 1% per month. So if you went on at 66 in six months, you would get a 4% increase. If you wait till 70, you get a 32% increase. It's not paid to the spouse, and that's going to be important when we talk about strategies. Uh, but it is paid to a widower widower, the person's deceased, survivor. So survi life case versus survivor's case, quite different on that. So we're only talking about while the person's still alive, retirement. It's only payable to the worker. So the way it works is this. If you file, you could file between age 62 and 70. Let's assume for the sake of numbers, and the reason I'm using this is we also have when to start receiving uh, retirement benefits, uh, that fact sheet, they use $1,000 and lots of people use it. So just for the sake of numbers, there's no magic to it. If your full retirement age is $1,000, you go on as early as 62, you get 75% of the benefits, $750. Obviously, you get 1,000 at 66. If you wait till 70, you get $1,320. It's a significant increase. What's the downside to this? This is pretty straightforward. You have to live the eight years. And while I'm being facetious, the point is, it really is terribly serious in the sense of, what is your health? The way the system is set up, if you wait it for the delayed retirement credits, apply dutifully at 70, you want to get your benefit, and you are go out and you are get hit by a meteorite the next month, so security isn't paying you eight years back going, wow, they were really nice enough to wait, it's too bad. You've lost out, it is a flip of the coin as far as your health, longevity, and so forth. But if you can, it is a nice payback. And again, I've used age 70, it's any time between 66 and 70 that percentage. Again, it's on a monthly basis they're actually paying. But you have a choice. You have selections. Full retirement age gives you many, many more choices. And this is a great one example. Obviously, go on prior to full retirement age, you get a permanent reduction. Once you're at full retirement age, do what you like as far as do you want to continue working? Uh, do you want to keep paying into Social Security? Do you want to get paid now? you want to wait a couple of years down the road? You have choices. You have options. Prior to this, once you apply, you've applied prior to your full retirement age. So you have to take that into account. It matters. The full retirement age gives you a bit more, quite a bit more freedom, in fact. When do you apply? This is very simple, so we'll quickly go through it. Two to three months before you want to receive payment. You can file online. Approximately 60% of the people in the country do that. Um, but it's not for everyone. So Social Security does have telephone appointments and in office appointments, because in some cases, much more complicated. Some people have a much more challenging situation. If you're a person who's 62, 63, you're stopping work, you never intend to work ever again. You're going to go visit Bimini and you're not coming back. And you're single and you never want to do anything, just send me my money, do it online. It takes 20 minutes, you're done. On the other hand, if you need to talk to someone, you need a bit more information on it, and you haven't been able to get it online, you've called the toll-free number, the 1-800-772-1213, but you really want to talk to a claims representative while you're actually thinking about applying, you can do it by phone or in office. Most of the time, it's just as easy to do it by telephone. We, we oftentimes don't even need a lot of the proofs from you because we already have that. For example, a birth certificate. We already have agreements with the 50 Bureau of Vital Statistics, the state's BVSs. So in many cases, unless there's some error on our record or theirs, very simple. So, want to mention this, your benefits can be taxable. About a third of the people who get Social Security have to actually pay taxes. I'm not going to spend any time on these two paragraphs about the amounts because that's all you'll find in understanding the benefits. And if you go on our website, that's all you're going to see. We are not tax consultants. We don't do taxes. What we'll do is refer you to the Internal Revenue Service. However, if you go on the IRS website, irs.gov, and look for their publication 915, 915, 
Social Security and equivalent railroad retirement benefits, it goes into excruciating detail. It covers everything to explain whether you have to pay taxes or not. So my suggestion, and obviously the 1040 actually has a worksheet and to use, but if you're really interested in what counts non-taxable income, what about interest, what are other things, how, how does this apply, and one half of Social Security, what's the formula, just go to publication 915. If you didn't find it on your own 1040, the booklet, that will do it all. But again, those numbers are, are, we are referenced in uh, the understanding the benefits. But if you do want to have federal taxes withheld, if I don't step on that, uh, you can choose to have them. You need to complete the IRS form, uh, W-4V, and you can actually get it off of our website. What we do is actually send you over to the IRS website. The only minus is, and I, I don't know if we should say it's a minus, you can only select a percentage of the monthly benefit. There's no flat dollar amount unless it happens. So you can't say, I want $7.27. It's going to be a certain percentage, 7, 10, 15, or 25. But you can do that. And if later on you find you've withheld too much, not enough, you just submit another W-4. You can always make the change. So it's not in perpetuity. So when you apply, you can do it then. If you want to wait, see what happens, you can come back. It's not a problem other than just be aware of how Social Security pays benefits. People do realize that you have to live throughout the month to get a payment for the month. Okay? Yes or no? You may have, yes, if they, everyone knows this, you have to live throughout the month. I'm going to repeat this because when you apply for benefits and we say you're entitled for the month of June, that benefit will show up in July. You have to live throughout the month to get a benefit for the month. And so Uncle Sam's not bad about this. So you have to know this. So if you want it to have the amount start to withheld, and you say, I want it for July. Do you mean for the month you're going to receive it or the month you're entitled to the benefit? Be very specific on it. So in terms of Social Security benefits, you have to live throughout the month. So Today, April, April's benefit will show up in May, May, June, June, July, and so forth. Now, let's talk about some of the so-called strategies people discuss. One of them is called, and you've heard this, withdrawing the benefit. What if you apply for a retirement benefit? Say you're 63. You apply for retirement benefits and you say, no, nah, I'm taking a permanent cut, but I found a new job. Do I really want to receive Social Security because there are limits on how much you can earn? We're going to talk about this. There are limits on how much you can earn if you're under full retirement age and still receive all of your benefits. So you might set, or something else comes up, the greatest job in the universe shows up and you just don't need Social Security or want to now. You want to wait until full retirement age or delay retirement credits. If you started receiving Social Security benefits less than 12 months ago, it's got to be no more than a year, you can change and you change your mind. You may be able to withdraw your Social Security and reapply at a later date. You literally would have to contact us. You submit an actual withdrawal form. All of the money that you've been paid has to come back. If you have a spouse, divorce, if so, children receiving them, all the money's come back because you're starting at square one. So everybody has to be in agreement. So if you want to withdraw your claim and your spouse is receiving benefits on your social security number, your spouse also has to agree with you. You just be aware of this that in terms of a withdrawal, if it affects, it affects everyone, basically, as far as that's concerned. Also, if you're over 65, not 66, 65 is for Medicare, are there Medicare issues? For example, paying the Part B premium that we will talk about later. Well, they can't take it out of your Social Security benefit, so you would be billed on a, a quarterly basis. Do you where? So Medicare issues might come in. So you do have to be careful, and they will go over this with you. But the point is, you do have the a potential option to withdrawing if it's worth your while, if you've changed your mind. And, this, and the reason for bringing this up for some people is there is work before full retirement age, but it's limited if you want to receive all of your Social Security payments. In other words, actual earnings, wages from employment, earnings from self-employment, we're not talking about private pensions, 401ks, thrift savings, stocks you've earned, savings, bonds, none of those. 
any of the investments, those do not count. But if you intend to work and you're under full retirement age, there are caps. Every calendar year, they change a little bit generally. But the point is, you ha if you want all of your monthly benefits within a calendar year, you actually have to stay within those limits. If you're going to be going over, it might be more problematic for you. It's a challenge. Is it worth doing? You have to think about this. So work before full retirement age. The limits on how much you can earn still receive all of your benefits in a calendar year. They're not talking about forever. Each, it's every calendar year. The month you attain your full retirement age, and once again, this is why the um, FRA, the full retirement age, is so useful, your earnings no longer reduce your benefits. So if Jan decides to become the next Oprah Winfrey and turns 66, and all of you can get her autograph now, save it, and then when it occurs, sell it on, you know, and Amazon will probably let you do an e-book on it. But until the, the Jan I do, correct? Beginning with that month of full retirement age, Social Security will send you your benefits if you like. Or if you want to delay retirement credits, you can defer. But the point is you have a choice, and it is your choice, not Social Security's. Once you're at full retirement age, decide whether you want to continue working or not, but decide whether you want to delay retirement credits or not. Your options completely depend upon what you want to do. Prior to full retirement age, you don't have that option. There are limits on how much you can earn. I brought the uh, little trifold, how work affects your benefits. And we're not, we don't have enough time to go through. It takes a bit of time, and really, you need to use this. There's also, when I send you in the links, there'll be an earnings calculator. So you can actually say, what if I earn this amount? What happens? But the annual amounts, notice, if you're under full retirement age, it's $15,720. And nobody's driving a Bentley, as far as I know, with this thing. There is also another amount that when you turn your full retirement, the year you turn your full retirement age, if you want to collect prior to your full retirement age, you can earn a certain amount. And notice it's, it's a heftier amount. You can make almost 42000 Now, they don't break it per month. They just say, when do you turn 60, whatever, say 66 is your full retirement age. Say you're turning it in June. January through May, you can make 42000 and if you apply for benefits, they would send you five months of Social Security benefits as long as your earnings were under 41880 So it's a nice choice. I bring that up because you might not have wanted to apply at 62 or 3 or 4 because it's such a hefty cut, uh, such a large reduction, but a few months might not be. So again, please look through this. Uh, but this is really for someone who typically would want to collect benefits. Prior to that, notice under full retirement age, 15,720. You'll also notice the yearly amounts divided by 12. So 15,720 is 1310 a month, 41,880, 3490 a month. There's a reason for it in the first year of your retirement. There's a one-time earnings rule. There are non-service months, and it's usually used the first year of your retirement. If you're, for example, not yet in your full retirement year, and you're making a, a reasonably substantial salary, or your earnings are well over the 15,720. But once you retire, you're going to be under 13,10 for X number of months. Whenever, say you stop work at the end of June. How many people here make a million a year? Raise your hand. Okay, no free lunch for you. Anyway, say you made a million a year. You're stopping at the end of June. You're going to make 500000 You're way over 15 7 20 and every $2 over one's withheld. What Social Security would say is, well, are you working from July through December? And if you said, I'm making less than 13 10 for each month, they'll send you all six months of your benefits. The reason this is important is vacation, bonus, severance pay, sick pay. If you leave and you're not coming back, you've actually stopped work. Sometimes we get people who stop work, they get a bonus three months down the road. They've curtailed their work. We want all the monies back into the first month that they actually stop work. So it might be in that case, it behooves you to talk about these uh, non-service months to a Social Security representative. That's why I say not for everyone is the case. Yes, sir? I'm not understanding what you're talking about. You're saying you can't buy Social Security in a month. Oh, sure. But if you're under full retirement age, there are limits on how much you can earn. Oh, after full retirement age, you, you can be incredibly wealthy. Remember, this is only for 
of those who are under full, re if you're not yet in full retirement year. If you're at full retirement age, make as much as you like, Social Security will send you your benefit regardless. But if you're under full retirement age and it's all the way up to the last month, the month before you turn full retirement age, there are limits on how much you can earn. I don't want to overstate the 15,720 this year because if you turn full retirement age two years down the road, it'll be higher. But there's going to be a cap, a threshold. If you go over that, you start losing some of your benefit. You actually lose $1 for every $2 over that amount. So for someone who say, we'll use it for a number, say you're 63 years old, you filed for retirement last year. This year, you're going to work part-time. You're going to make 17720 I do this only so I can subtract. So you're going to make $17,720. You're allowed to make $15,720 for this calendar year. That leaves $2,000 over. $1,000 would have to come back from the total benefit due you in a calendar year. So you wouldn't get your full calendar year amount. However, you are going to get everything minus $1,000. So it all depends on how much you're earning. If you're making a substantial amount, then you really take a hit. If it's a lesser amount, and many people make a few thousand dollars over, then you say, it's not that bad. I, I'm really not losing that much money. So you, you have to make a decision. That's why it's important for each person. What are you going to be doing when you stop work? How much will you be earning? Are you going to continue working? If you're not, as I say, ignore all these slides. But if you intend to stop wor uh, work, maybe here or anywhere else, you apply for retirement benefits with Social Security under full ret and you're under full retirement age, and then you want to go back to work, there are limits on how much you can earn. So you have to make a decision on that and just be aware. And what you would do is just call us and say, oh, I went back to work and I'm making 20000 this year or 18000 And they would say, well, we're going to withhold two months of benefits or a month of benefits because of your estimate. And if you change your mind later on, you can call us again and say, hey, I got fired. Or I was so good they made me president. You know, whatever. The point is, let us know. The real key is call that 1-800 number, the 772-1213, if there are any questions. That's what you have to do. But does that answer the question? At full retirement age, become the wealthiest person in the room. You now have a target. OK. Now, many of you probably have heard about file and suspend. This, this comes up again and again. It, it's written in a lot of the, the financial pages. You'll see it online everywhere. If you reach full retirement age, once again, this is why it's so important about full retirement age. Know what your full retirement age is. But you're not yet age 70. You can ask us to suspend retirement benefit payments. As a single person, we're going to talk about spouses. You can just you apply for benefits. You can voluntarily suspend the benefits for any month for which you have not received a payment. And the reason this is mentioned is, let's assume you were 66, you were thinking, I'll probably stop at retirement. I want two years of delayed retirement credit, 67, 68, and I'm going to stop work. But what if you become ill when you're 67? You can't work anymore. Would you want the delayed retirement credits? Or if you suspended the benefits, we could actually pay you back to the month you turn for retirement age. Now, it depends on the end. This goes back again to longevity, health, funding streams, a range of other things and you might want to talk to us about it, but this is on our website. I'm going to send you the link which has the file and suspend. That's just for a person, one individual, on your record. And I've seen that in a few cases, the reason I mention this, where it's stated maybe you should think about it. All depends on your choice, what you want to do. But you have an option, the file and suspend. But once again, it's full retirement age. I'm, I know I keep repeating this, but full retirement age gives you choices. Prior to full retirement age, you don't have those choices. And in fact, you could not have applied prior to full retirement age and get this. You're waiting until full retirement age. Which leads into spouse's benefits. There are spouse's benefits for retirement. Uh, 12 months of marriage. You have to have been married 12 calendar months. The spouse has to be at least age 62, and there'll be a reduction because the person's going on prior to full retirement age if they apply prior before, before they hit full retirement age. You have to realize. So age 62 is the earliest, but there's a reduction because they're under the full retirement age. The worker has to be entitled. So I married, my wife never worked under Social Security. 
she's going to apply for benefits on my social security number. One, she has to be at least 62. Two, I have to be either at least 62 or disabled. I've got to be entitled. I've got to be receiving a social security benefit. There are uh, uh, young wife's benefits, young husband's benefits if you're under 62 and they're taking care of a child. But I'm just using in terms of the months based on age, not have months payable to someone because they have a child with them. That's a different issue because the age isn't as meaningful as children's benefits. So got to be married at least a year, got to be at least retirement age like the other person, and the worker has to be getting something. So I'm 62, I apply for benefits, my wife is 62, she's going to love that I've pushed her age up. She's 62, she would apply on my social security number. I'm on, I'm on retirement, she's on retirement. Now, there are divorced spouses benefits also. You have to be currently divorced, you cannot be remarried. The marriage has to have lasted at least 10 years. And I will, I've said this before, it cannot seem like 10 years. You cannot remember it as 10 years. It can't have felt like 20 years. It is 10 years of marriage, calendar years. Now, by the way, if you divorce someone, I don't want to, I'm being facetious, but this is a serious point. Um, if you divorce someone and you remarry them and the total amount of time comes up to 10 years, that would make them potentially eligible. So. I don't want to be too glib about that, but 10 years of marriage, they have to be at least age 62. Again, if you're going on prior to full retirement age, there's going to be a reduction. The worker can be 62 and not entitled. We're going to talk about that. Just keep that in mind. The worker can be married. In other words, I could divorce my current wife, remarry, come in, say we're all 62. I'm 62. I have a current spouse who's 62. And I have my ex-spouse, 62, obviously pining away from me because I'm not there. You didn't believe that either, did you? No, I know, it did go. But I, I should do it the other way where I'm pining away from my wife, but she has to do her own presentation. So I'm 62. My current spouse applies on my Social Security number. My ex-spouse has never worked under Social Security or very little, is now going to apply on my Social Security number, but cannot be married because my ex-spouse is applying on my number. So whomever is applying on the number cannot be remarried. All right. Now, let's assume she did get married and got divorced again. Still pining away for me. It had never worked. Okay. I'm just going to keep beating that into the ground. I don't care. So, so if that's the case and she were married to that person for 10 years, could then have an option of which pays the most. She could apply either on mine or on the other ex-spouse. But again, they cannot be married as a divorced spouse and come in on that. So that really does, but the potential is always there. So you should always keep that, for anyone who is divorced, keep that social security number. Always be aware of that. The reason for it is this. There is what's called an independently entitled divorced spouse. You can receive benefits even though the worker has not applied for benefits. Let's assume I'm, I'm 62, I divorce my spouse, but I, I want those delayed retirement credits. I'm never stopping work. If she's been married to me at least 10 years and divorced at least two, and she has to be at least 62 and meet all the other requirements of a spouse, she could apply on my benefits even though I've never applied for benefits. So if you have a friend, because I've had this come up many times, where someone's divorced, male or female, but I'm using, and in terms of someone like my wife who goes, I've been, I was married for X number of years, better than 10. Um, we've been divorced for X, Y number of years. Uh, he's 62, but he's gonna continue working, so I've gotta wait till he stops. No, if you're potentially eligible, you could apply on that person's account number. Has no impact on their dollar amount, by the way. Has no impact on the current spouse. So for those of you who got married and have several ex-spouses because you did it 10 years, there's a, there's a limit on how many you can have, okay? But let's assume you had a shelf life of 10 years each time. The point is, all of them potentially could be applying if you were divorced more than two years. So 
We don't want people to lose, and the reason for it is obvious. Two people are 62, one wants to get to the late retirement credits. The other person, remember, the spouse cannot apply while they're getting delayed retirement credits, well, you know, and there's no file to spend. This is just a case of, hey, we were married more than 10 years, we've been divorced more than two. If I'm potentially eligible for benefits, I meet the other requirements, I can apply. Now, the reason you don't see a million people coming out of the woodwork doing this is spouse's benefits are calculated differently from retirement benefits. A spouse's benefit, maximum of 50% of the worker's full retirement age if the spouse is full retirement age. In other words, let's use the $1,000 again. If I get $1,000 on my social security number, my spouse, the maximum she can ever receive, if she had never worked under social security, is 50% of mine. So the maximum she could get is $500. So what if she gets more on her own? Why would she be applying on mine? So that, and, and spouse's benefit, same formula for a divorced spouse which once again is why you don't have people lined up and around the block doing this because of that amount. Survivors are different. You get a higher amount, so we're gonna show that. Doesn't affect the worker's monthly benefit. So, this is the way it works. Let's, I keep saying, what if they're not insured? What if they are? What if my wife, and she has, worked under Social Security? Before full retirement age, you are deemed to file. What does that mean? If insured, that is, they worked enough to get a benefit on their own Social Security number, the spouse must file for their own retirement first. File as a spouse if due additional benefits. If they get more on their own record, no spouse's benefit is payable. What does deemed filing mean? You cannot file for a reduced retirement benefit, insurance benefit, or reduced spouse's benefit without filing for the other benefit if eligibility is possible. Obviously, if I'm 56 and my wife's 62, she can't, she's not going to be forced to apply on my account number because I didn't apply. But, I, and could not because of my age. But the point is, if the benefits are there for both, for, uh, both a spouse and on your own retirement, and you're under full retirement age, you cannot put them one to the side. Because we get this oftentimes, well, my spouse is going to apply on her or his own social security number, and then because I've made more money, the 50%, they can get something on my own. Well, in fact, they can't. They'd have to do both. We've got about 15 more minutes. I know. <clears throat> Plenty of time, because that's why I left the Medicare at the end. So if you're, you and your current spouse are full retirement age, one of you can apply for retirement benefits now. Oh, by the way, thank you, though, because I did notice there's not a clock around. Uh, one, one of you can apply for retirement benefits now have the payments suspended. Again, if you're full retirement age, while the other applies only for spouse's benefits, the strategy allows both of you to delay receiving retirement benefits on your own record so you can get the DRCs, the delayed retirement credits. Only one of you can apply for retirement benefits and have the payments suspended. Now we're talking at full retirement age. What if I'm full retirement age, my wife's 62, hasn't worked under Social Security, or has a little bit. She, I could suspend my benefit allow her to apply as a spouse on my account number, but she'll take a reduced benefit because she's under full retirement age. And that's why it's really essential to be aware what's a full retirement age, your options are far greater later on. Because after all, if she applies for spouse benefits on my account number, she's going to have to apply on her own social security number, she can't get the delayed retirement credit. So it really does matter when do you want to apply, prior or afterwards. Doesn't mean you can't, but you have to be aware that there are the, the reductions involved. And in this case, I shouldn't say penalty, but it, it might be disadvantage, uh, disadvantageous to you. And very quickly, survivor benefits. The earliest is age 60. By the way, this is gender neutral, doesn't matter male or female. Age 50 if disabled, but those are very few and far between, very stringent in the disability. So as opposed to being 62, if I die, I predecease my wife, if she's 60 or older, she has the, the ability to apply on my social security number to get a widow's benefit. It'll be reduced, but notice she can go on well ahead. If her full retirement age were 66, she can go on six years ahead. It is a permanent reduction though, but there's an exception. We're gonna talk about this. 
it's any age if you have a child in care, but I'm not going to deal with this. So age 60 is the earliest. In many cases, you don't see people applying because the annual earnings limits, the ones we were talking about before, prior to full retirement age, applies also to a survivor. So for example, if my wife predeceases me, I might be entitled to a widower's benefit, but guess what? I'm still working. Well, how much am I earning? If I'm earning too much, is it really in my interest to apply? So that's, that's an exception. Deeming does not apply to survivor benefits, though. Let's assume that I, 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 I predecease my wife. She's 62. She's entitled to benefits on her own account number if she applies, and also on my own Social Security number. She can choose to apply for a reduced benefit at 62, if she likes, on her own Social Security number, come back and get the full unreduced widow's benefit on my Social Security number, or apply on mine and get the delayed retirement credits and wait all the way till 70 if she likes. Deeming doesn't apply. So when we were emphasizing the prior point about applying early and full retirement age, it's different for our survivors because these are two different points. One's a life case, one obviously is a death case. So there are more options in that. But she could delay one. And all of this is on our website. And if a person has a question, they should call the 1-800 number. And what does a survivor receive? 100% of the full retirement age amount. However, if you begin receiving Social Security benefits early, that is prior to full retirement age, Social Security cannot pay your surviving spouse a full benefit from your record. In other words, the full unreduced amount from the full retirement age cannot be paid because you went on earlier. And that, by the way, is on the back page of the uh, when to start receiving retirement benefits. So there are three things going on. If you apply early, you get a reduced benefit. This isn't to talk people out, but you should be aware. It's reduced benefit. Two, there are limits on how much you can earn and still receive all of your Social Security benefits. And three, if the survivor benefit is important to you. So if it matters to me that my wife receive a survivor's benefit on my Social Security number, if I apply early, there's a carryover effect. She'll never receive my full retirement age amount. Now, perhaps she gets such a high amount on her own, it doesn't matter. The issue here is how much do you get on each one, but the point is, I went on early, there's a carryover to the survivors. You'll notice, not to the current spouse. In other words, whether I apply for retirement benefits at 62 or 66, my spouse, my current wife, her benefits, while I'm still alive, would be based on 50% of my full retirement age if she's full retirement age. They're going to ignore the fact that I apply. Predecease, survivor's benefits, it does carry over. So really go on the website, go through these. Finally, we're going to end this, Medicare.gov um, has all of the information. We also have it on our uh, actual web page ourselves when I was showing you the screenshots. Retirement, disability, survivors, Medicare. The point is, please go through this. We didn't have time to go over it because we wanted to talk about the strategies, but Medicare.gov, and they're very good because basically plenty of information about how to apply. You can apply for Medicare and delay applying for cash benefits if you choose. Um, we'll be sending the PowerPoint, so, and now I will include some of the um, slides on the Medicare, which we haven't had the time to get to. Any questions about many, many of the slides we've just gone through? Yes, right, it takes time. One of the things I want to leave is, and I hear people do this all the time, it's really simple, I know everything, I don't have any questions. It, it is important that you do be aware that, yeah, is this confusing, is it complicated? It only applies 58 million people. One out of every six people in this country gets a Social Security benefit. And the baby boom generation, when that goes, we'll be having 70, 75, 80 million people. One out of every five individuals is going to get a Social Security benefit. How could you not have 20% of your population and keep it as simple as possible? Because you're all different. And that's why go on the website, create the account, look at the retirement estimator, check the links I'll give on spouses, file and suspend. All of you are different on it. And also I'll, I'll have the calculator for the, uh, the annual earnings limits and more links for that. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. the only way she's going to get to the security. Okay. Is there any way she can participate in the delayed retirement? 
no, there are no delayed retirement credits for the spouse, which is why they do the file and suspend. For, now, delayed retirement credits can only be on your own earnings record. It's per person. So if your wife were insured and delayed applying for benefits, she could get the delayed retirement credits, but she cannot partake of the delayed retirement credits while you're alive. Now, the minute you predecease her, she applies as a widow, and then she does get the delayed retirement credits. Right, this is not an excuse for anyone to be running over someone in a parking lot, but just as a, there. But the point is that that really is the case. So a survivor would get it, current spouse does not. At what age do you stop collecting 35 years? Oh, they're always doing 35 years. So I can run right now as a retirement? You could work till you're 100, and if your earnings amount was high enough to bump one of the 35 years, that's one way of bringing up your benefit. Yes, so you could do that. No, it, though, you, you'll always get the cost of living adjustment. That's a different issue. The issue you're talking about is your actual earned income. Is it high enough to replace one of the 35 years? Everyone gets the cost of living adjustments applied to you from then, from you know, whether you, you go on at 70, 75. If you, were, if you were deceased at age 50, in fact, and your spouse, then your widow, applied on your social security number, all those cost of living increases over the years would apply to it and the monthly benefit would be higher come the time she applied at age 60 for example so those are always going to be applied there are a couple cases where it doesn't hit in the computation but it's not in perpetuity so you could increase your benefit you get the cost of living adjustments you get the delay retirement credits and if your earnings are high enough you can replace one of the 35 years used in the formula you can do all of them in fact Yes, sir. What is the biggest uh, financial mistake that people make? Aside from not going on our website, the <laughs> I think that one of the things. See, the, the we stay away from the full retirement age because we're not consult financial consultants, and because you get into these tax issues, which is you'll notice how I got off the tax within one slide. You can't do that. But I do think the prior to full retirement age, the number of people who apply early, who feel I need to apply now, and if you waited a little bit, probably would be better. Because that's why I list those three points. That in many cases, you'll get someone who applies for retirement and says, I'm not going to work. I don't worry about it. Yeah, I know I'm taking a cut. Is your wife going to be, will, you, will she outlive you? Will she apply on your social security number? Well, if she does, she's now going to get a lower benefit. Do you know that? And in many cases, people aren't aware. So it's more of a combination rather than just one when you add them together. And that's why I suggest really going on the website and exploring it. One, it's your tax money at work, just as I am. But the other point is it really is essential because it might be different for each person. Someone might not care about the work, but they do care about the survivor's benefit. If you're single, you're not going to worry about that but delayed retirement credits might be meaningful. So it, it, it is very much individualized, but I think prior to full retirement age, knowing that full retirement age gives you a broader range of activities, like the file and suspend if you're single. It's not a bad idea. Any other questions on, please, I'll send, again, links to the publications, links to what I've talked about, and create the, the account online. Make sure we've got the right numbers. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you so much.